I used to visit death-themed subreddits like watch people die in morbid curiosity very regularly. I don't know why, but I've always been drawn to that kind of stuff. Horror movies, real life stories, it all fascinates me. I wish I had looked away because there are some things you just can't unsee. I remember one video in particular. A man is cut in half by a train. His legs severed and viscera scattered. Well, he miraculously and horribly remains alive for a few minutes waiting for death. That one really got me. Not just the carnage inflicted on the poor man, but the fact that a huge group of bystanders did nothing but film him. No one offered comforts. No one held his hand. Maybe that's why, when I was faced with a similar situation, I acted how I did. I was walking back to my office building near the end of my lunch break, after getting a sandwich at a local deli. The weather was a perfect spring day, blue sky with a slight breeze, and the scent of the ocean on the air. The tranquility was shattered by the screech of tires, the sound of metal on metal, and the most horrendous screams I've ever heard. I quickly saw the source. A bicyclist had been hit by a truck and was lying half crushed on the side of the street. Everyone around was in similar shock, and it was like we all took a collective moment for our brains to catch up to what we were seeing. Suddenly, with the speed of an elastic band snapping back, time moved normally again, and people began calling for 911, directing traffic, clearing the scene. But no one approached the man. In that instant, I remembered the video, I knew what I had to do, and before I could think I rushed to the victim's side. To say it was the worst thing I've ever seen is a gross understatement. The man's intestines were spilling out of a gash that nearly severed him in two. One of his legs was a pulp of red, and the smell, god, the smell was unfathomable. As I approached I saw that my fear was confirmed. He was conscious. Imagine knowing you're mortally injured, aware that you are living the last few moments of your life. It's not a fate I would wish on anyone, so I did what I could. I knelt by his side, careful not to look at his injuries more than necessary. His eyes were huge, with pupils blown out and the whites rolling like a wild horse's. As he saw me, he stilled a little and reached for me with his working arm. I murmured as I clasped his hand. I'm here, I've got you. I didn't know what else to say in that moment. He stared at me and his labored breathing slowed a little. Am I going to die? He rasped, blood frothing in the corner of his lip. I couldn't lie, and I couldn't give him false hope. We both knew the truth. Yeah, but you have nothing to be scared of. You're going where we all end up, eventually. I know this isn't what you want, but you're going on a new adventure. I tried to make my words even and calm, stroking the back of his hand. After that, we were silent, him broken and prone on the pavement, me his sentinel cradling his hand in mine. The whole while I prayed for his end to come quickly. Mercifully, he passed soon after. Before the sirens of the approaching ambulance could even be heard, the paramedics found me still sitting with him, and when they took over I quickly stumbled away and threw up the sandwich I'd eaten earlier. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. Witnessing his last breath, but I knew it had been the right thing. I called him to work shortly after and let my boss know what had happened. He was suitably appalled and told me to take as much time as I needed. To be honest, I don't remember my commute home or even how I got to my car in the first place. I stumbled into my apartment and got right into a hot shower, clothes and all, thinking only of washing the man's blood off when I emerged later, scrubbed pink and feeling more exhausted than I ever had, 
I had only thoughts of sleeping for a long while. I moved slowly, like cold syrup, and entered my bedroom, flicking on the lights. There on my bed was a beautifully wrapped gift box. In hindsight, I should have been more worried, knowing that no one had access to my apartment. But in that moment, my brain was functioning at little more than static frequency. Puzzled, I carefully removed the shiny ebony paper. A cold chill seemed to seep from the box, and I opened it to reveal a massive onyx fabric. Extricating it fully from the box, I held it up, revealing a long hooded cloak, the color of darkest midnight. It was then that I saw the card. In delicate calligraphy, it only said five words, for a job well done. Despite how it may appear, this is not a story about death. This is a story about free will. The weeks following the accident passed in a blur. I couldn't sleep and ended up with a prescription for some chemical aid, which succeeded in numbing my mind and blunting the edge of reality. For days I didn't bathe and existed in a fog interrupted by tasteless meals and even more tasteless daytime TV. The cloak was put into the closet, crammed into the back by the leftover Christmas wrapping paper and spare linens, where it sat forgotten. After a month in a purgatory of grief and shock, I finally emerged and rejoined the living. Work resumed. I cautiously started going out with friends, and life moved on for a time, although my mind never strayed too far from what I'd witnessed that day on the street. I was processing it, and slowly but surely I was coming to peace. It was about 12 weeks later that all of my progress came grinding to a violent halt. Again, it was a beautiful sunny day, birds chirping and not a single cloud in the sky. As I sipped my coffee on the patio, I saw that the apartment groundskeeper was about to do some mowing. I sat and watched him work idly thinking about my own tasks for the day ahead. I reached for my coffee, savoring the morning, when my left hand suddenly went numb. It felt like it had been dipped into ice water, pins and needles dancing across my flesh. I stood up suddenly, knocking into my patio table in my haste, looking for a source of the chill. At that moment, I saw the groundskeeper from the corner of my eye, Pushing the mower, between one step and the next, he suddenly went stiff. A marionette with all his strings pulled taut. My hand forgotten, I turned just in time to see him collapse in the grass. The bird song stopped, along with everything else. In slow motion, I watched blades of grass float to the ground, and my discarded coffee cup seemed to be suspended in the air. Like a wave crashing, Time caught up suddenly. The cacophony of noise from the nearby streets punctuated by the smash of my mug on the patio floor. In the span of a heartbeat, I was outside and beside the collapsed man. A neighbor had also seen him fall, and I could hear him on the phone with emergency dispatch. But one look at the groundskeeper and I knew it was too late. So once more, I found myself holding the hand of a man struggling through the last moments of his life. He clutched at his chest, frantically trying to draw breath, while I supplicated, knees and grass clippings, praying for his peace. He gripped my hand tighter, eyes metronome ticking between mine and the ring in his left hand. The truth of the situation seeming to settle in, he tried desperately to tell me something. It came out as a near whisper, impossible to decipher. I'll tell her you love her, but she already knows. From the wedding band on his finger, I guessed at what he was trying to say. Tears pooled in his eyes, but he nodded. The pleading look replaced by something closer to acceptance. Focus on your love. She can feel it. I took a deep breath my own tears choking my voice. My words seemed to be lulling him though, and a faint smile had appeared on his lips. 
Just think of all the stories you'll have to tell, eh? When you see each other again. His eyes closed slowly like a setting sun, and his chest stilled. While my hand, still clasped in his, gave another flare of icy cold. He was gone. Later, after the paramedics had been and went, and the crowd of neighbors had dispersed like carrion crows called home, I was again alone in my apartment. Although my hand had returned to a normal temperature, a hot shower was needed. Like after the first incident, I was numb. I guess death is cold. As the scolding water rained down on me, I couldn't stop my mind from going over the events of the two deaths I'd now borne witness to. The scenes looping, replaying in tandem, reflecting the fragility of life. I was not okay. I was deeply affected by what I had been involved in. But I also knew that if given a do-over, I would make the same choices again. To be there for those last moments so they wouldn't be alone. When I finally stepped from the tub, the bathroom was thick with fog. The mirror obscured by film. I blindly reached for a towel. But my hands settled on an unfamiliar fabric hanging from the rack. The inky black cloak was no longer tucked away in the closet. After witnessing the second man's passing, I was understandably checked out. Laughter was a memory. Happiness, a whispered rumor. I was scared to go outside lest I be in the wrong place at the wrong time again. Although I was honored to have been able to hopefully bring a modicum of comfort to the men I'd seen pass. My mental state was suffering. I began getting headaches. Ice picks driven deep behind my eyes. The only cure being isolation in a dark, silent room. My friends, despite my protests, were determined not to let me waste away behind closed doors. They brought care packages, kept me updated on the lives of mutual acquaintances, and even drove me to doctor's appointments. While I took a sabbatical from work and tried to find relief from my headaches, I was hounded constantly by the thought of the black hooded cloak. I hadn't moved it from the towel rack in the bathroom. The thought of even touching it too much for me to take on in my admittedly fragile state. One Sunday I awoke inexplicably determined to get some fresh air into my lungs. So I ventured out to the beach near my house. Overwhelmed by the prospect of crowds, I ensured I arrived early and claimed a spot in the shade under a beautiful willow tree. I nestled into my blanket closed my eyes, and let the sounds of the gently lapping waves drift over me. It was the most peaceful I'd felt since everything had happened. I don't know how long I lay there, in the magical place between sleep and wakefulness, blessedly free from headaches. When I finally fully awoke, the sun was high in the sky, and although my patch of shade had shrunk and I could feel the beginnings of a sunburn, my left hand tingled with a chill. I've never understood the saying, my blood ran cold, until that moment. I knew, without a doubt, that I was about to witness another death. My mind raced as I considered running. My self-preservation panicked at the thought that this was no longer something I could chalk up to coincidence. But it was too late. A woman's voice, tentative at first, began calling for her child. The woman's calls quickly became more frantic, and soon others had taken up the call as well. I stood up from my blankets, eyes pulled to the horizon, where a small shape was barely discernible amongst the waves. I could have alerted someone else, but I knew this was my task alone. Like the inevitability of death, I had begun to accept what was happening. I sprinted to the water and plunged in, thankful for my years spent swimming as I quickly covered the distance to the child. By now, others had seen where I was heading and were attempting to catch up and help, but I was the first to arrive by a large margin, as I knew I would be. When I reached the little girl, I saw that she was small, no older than eight or nine, her long blonde hair streaming around her like a mermaid. 
Her blue eyes were open, and as I reached for her, she slipped under the water. I dove down, her gaze locking with mine as I followed her towards the sandy bottom of the ocean. She had already gone still, no longer thrashing, her hands delicately floating in front of her in a graceful arc of ballerina's pose. Now parallel and eye to eye, I took her small fingers in my numb left hand, and the air left her lungs in a final cloud of tiny, perfect bubbles. I could swear I heard her sigh. For a few heartbeats we swayed together under the surface, the quiet calm a private refuge from the chaos I knew was occurring above. When I finally broke the surface, bringing her up with me, a crowd of other swimmers were there to help pull her to shore. Although it was too late, a few people attempted to resuscitate her on the beach, seeing all I had needed to, and knowing there was nothing more to do, I stumbled away to the tree, forgotten by the other rescuers and the hysterical mother, now weeping over her child's slight frame. I collapsed on my blanket, unable to move or form a cohesive thought, slowly with infinite tenderness. A warmth settled around me. Looking down at myself, I saw that the black cloak had been draped around my shoulders. I whirled around, desperate to see who had wrapped it around me, to finally identify the gift giver, who had been my near constant cause of fear for the last few months. No one was there, and no footprints marred the sand behind me. With raised hair and on the verge of a panic attack, I all but fled back to my home determined to check myself into a psychiatric facility, or a church, as soon as possible. At home, I hung the cloak up in the entryway, unaware as to why I hadn't left it behind. I was about to call a friend for help when I saw that I had a voicemail on my phone. It was the doctor's office, asking me to come in to discuss the results of my recent MRI. I knew then without having to fear the diagnosis, that it was something bad. The next day, the events at the beach put aside while I attended a meeting at the hospital brought sobering news. The cause of my headaches, although something I had tried to shrug off as inconsequential, was in fact an inoperable tumor. The prognosis, stiffly delivered by an unflinching specialist, gave me an expiry date akin to that of a carton of milk. There was a lot of talk about keeping me comfortable, and about decisions I would need to make, but there is one decision I must make before any others. When I arrived home, still in shock from the death sentence I was handed, a letter was waiting for me on my Krondunzu. The beautiful calligraphy, written in the same hand as the original card accompanying the cloak, bedecked the envelope addressed to me by name. With shaking fingers, I began to read. Death has never been the end, and as yours is approaching, you must decide. Will you wear the cloak? The choice, as always, is yours. So here I sit, my laptop the only illumination in my room, the cloak now draped across my bed. I have decisions to make. Whoever you are, this letter has found you for a reason. By now you know my story, and have likely compared it to the pages of your own. I wish I had had more time. Time to discuss it with you. To hear your thoughts. To ask how you'll react when you're called forth. Maybe it will be me who delivers your cloak, and I wonder what your choice will be when the time comes. Whatever you decide. I hope this last account will help you determine your path. As always, the choice is yours. It's strange, the things that come to mind when one contemplates their impending end. I thought I would have sat mournful over the places I had not traveled, the people I'd missed the most. But instead, one quote in particular kept playing over in my mind. Like a song on the radio that I couldn't escape, in the words of John Keats. For many a time, I have been half in love with easeful death. 
I wondered, as I prepared to meet him, if I would indeed love death. My mysterious benefactor and shadow. There was a nobility in the way I pictured him. Unmoving, endless, and quiet. I tried to picture the after, and I found it was like trying to imagine a new, unseen color. Despite my attempt to pry answers from the cloak's giver, none had appeared. I had written a return message on the letter left for me, but in the morning no new words had been penned. The uncertainty was the hardest part. If I accepted the cloak, I had somewhat of an idea of what my eternity would entail. Joining the ranks of reapers, ferrymen, and guides. I wondered idly which of the myths were closest to the truth. I wondered at the enormity of it. The possibility haunted me. However, that taking up this mantle would exclude me from the end which all others experience. What if, at the end of the lighted tunnel, a paradise awaited from which I would be barred entry? What if my loved ones were forever waiting on the other side, and eternity spent wondering why I had not appeared? Somewhat cruelly, I had been given a reprieve from the headaches. But the time bomb in my head remained. At least my mobility had returned. And I was able to once again leave my apartment in an attempt to enjoy the time I had left. Those attempts were futile. As my role as witness to death had increased in frequency, I was no longer presented with only the passing of humans. As I walked around the neighborhood one night, a pitiful mew, combined with the familiar tingling in my left hand, drew my attention. Under a towering cedar hedge lay a small black and white cat, mercifully free from blood. Playing my part by rote, I approached and knelt by the animal, intentively reached out to stroke its satiny fur. Its ribs were easily felt, its body withered by old age. The cat calmed almost instantly, nuzzling into the chill of my fingers. And for the first time since all of this had begun, I wasn't scared. There was an undeniable honor in this gift, or curse. When the cat had stilled, and my hand once again began to warm, I placed its nearly weightless body in a small grave I had dug under the cedar. It was such a stark contrast to the commotion that accompanies human death. To be silent and alone. No sirens wail. No tears or cries or frantic shouts. It was beautiful. A bird with a broken back, shattered upon my window. A dog struck by a careless driver and left behind like discarded trash. A moth, wings frail from a too short life spent chasing flames. All of them sought me, and I in turn was drawn to their ebbing light. Entombed safely within my home, a husk unable to venture out, I regretted that they would not be able to find me. I hoped someone else would comfort them when needed. My lungs struggled, while my heart trudged doggedly on with my Trojan horse chest. Hopes and secrets and all the things left unsaid, guarded safely behind my ribs. I wish I had saved my voice for something important. A grand last statement, but it was as though all of my remaining strength had pulled within my cold left hand. I knew that my friends and family could trust in my love for them. I left behind no large estate to be settled, nor children left bereft. Compared to many, my death was easy and uncomplicated. My thoughts shifted, machine gun rapid, between I'm fine, I'm at peace with this, I'm ready, I'm... And, please, I'm scared, I don't want to go. I'm sorry, I wish I had done more, seen more, and been more. Please don't let me go, I don't want to go. Don't forget me when I'm gone. Don't let me be a half-remembered name, said only out of obligation and false grief. I don't want to be alone. I can't. 
I took a deep breath, pulled through lips pressed tight with stubborn resolve lending strength to Duggan heels, still fighting against my end. I regretted not leaving my phone within reach, not seeking hospice care, not asking someone, anyone, to sit with me and talk me through it, to talk me out. Gently a hand clasped mine. I looked up from my bed, unable to move my head much, my muscles as pliant as a newborn calf's, and was struck by the way the black cloak he wore seemed to absorb all of the light in the room. He was taller than I thought, which brought me to near hysterical laughter, the absurdity of the moment too much to bear. Hello, I whispered, as my gaze shifted to where his eyes might have been, concealed within the abyss of his cloak's hood. For an eternity he was silent, his hand cold in mine, the chill oscillating between our fingers, dancing, becoming acquainted. Have you made a decision? Will you wear it? His voice was a breeze through a cornfield, the crackling of burning wood. His right hand motioned to the cloak I was given, pooled at the end of my bed. I tried once more to weigh the options, but my mind was consumed by the enormity of the moment. I felt as though I might fall off the earth, plunging into the cold vacuum of the universe. The thread which tethered me there was fraying. I felt light. I felt the strands connecting me to everything else. The force between all living things. I was breathing in the stars and they were breathing me back. I was right. There was nothing to fear. It was beautiful. My answer was a single nod. And with that we were floating. The cloak around me. Its edges blended with his. We were on ending. I was ready. You made the right choice, he said, voice strong and clear, as he pulled back his hood, and we began. <laughs>